Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching our session, Building Worlds of Color, Reimagining Speculative Fiction. I am Jewel Davis, an education librarian at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. And I am here with two amazing creatives, Jordan Ifueco and John Jennings. Jordan Ifueco is the New York Times bestselling author of the Ray Bear series. She is a Nebula Award, Ignite Award, Aldi Award, and Hugo Lodestar finalist. And she's been featured in People Magazine, NPR Best Books, NPR Pop Culture Hour, and ALA Top 10. She writes about magic black girls who aren't magic all the time because honestly, they deserve a vacation. Ifueco lives in Los Angeles with her husband, David, and their three-legged Trustafarian dog, Reggie. And John Jennings is a professor, author, graphic novelist, curator, Harvard fellow, New York Times bestseller, 2018 Eisner winner, and all around champion of black culture. As professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California at Riverside, Jennings examines the visual culture of race in various media forms, including film, illustrated fiction, and comics and graphic novels. He is also the director of Abrams Comic Arts imprint, Megascope, which publishes graphic novels focused on the experiences of people of color. And his research interests include the visual culture of hip hop, Afrofuturism and politics, visual literacy, horror, and the ethno-gothic, Gothic, and speculative design and its applications to visual rhetoric. Jennings is co-editor of the 2016 Eisner award-winning collection, The Blacker the Ink, Constructions of Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art, and co-founder, organizer of the Schomburg Center Black Comic Book Festival in Harlem. He is co-founder and organizer of the MLK Norcal's Black Comics Arts Festival in San Francisco, and also the Soul Con, the Brown and Black Comics Expo at the Ohio State University. So today we're gonna chat about the speculative genre, how it's being reimagined to represent diversity and the process with which the panel creators are doing work to reshape narratives. We'll end with some writing strategies, critical questions to consider when engaging with speculative media and some resources for further work in this genre. So let's go ahead and get into the Q&A. Um, so for me, speculative fiction and media has always been a favorite genre of mine. I grew up watching science fiction shows with my mom, like Stargate SG-1 and The Outer Limits, and reading books like Animorphs and fantasy series like Redwall. Um, so it's a genre that's always been a constant in my life in one way or another. So I'm curious about what brought you to speculative fiction and media, what led you to choose this genre to create in? So yeah, uh, like yourself, my mother. My mother was a huge factor. I, I grew up post, you know, civil rights era Mississippi, like in the like very agrarian, you know, a lot of time to like, you know, dream of, you know, starships and planets and stuff like that. So I was, I was an avid like stargazer. Like I was like, I was really into astronomy at a young age. My mom was a massive fan of like, science fiction, fantasy, horror, all the things. I was probably watching like too many movies that were like super inappropriate for me, <laughs> you know, but it just, she messed me up real in the best way though. You know, it was like, so I was, I've always been a huge fan of like horror, science fiction, fantasy. I was reading like Twilight Zone magazine, you know, uh, watching a lot of really bad B movies, you know, or, you know, bad, bad, that they're, they're so bad that they're good kind of thing. And I was, you know, and I'm the biggest Whovian in the world. Like I'm a massive Doctor Who fan, like that kind of stuff. Like. You know, so yeah, so comics, she got me my first comics, you know, uh, I was really into mythology, like from various cultures. So yeah, pretty much the same way that a lot of us start out, you know, it's like just understanding the power of dreaming and the beauty of, the, the beauty of monsters and all this type of thing. So it was really super early. And then of course, I started trying to make my own comics like super early too. I think I was probably copying Popeye, like in the first grade, like trying to make Popeye comic books. It was crazy. Anyway, but yeah, but it's my mom. My mom was the one that, you know, started me down this path, so. You know, the more I think about it, the more I feel like it was inevitable I had to become a fantasy author because pretty much every different aspect of the culture I was steeped in. So I was homeschooled actually until high school, which meant that like any kind of cultural influence I had, it was like, I feel like it was a multiplied effect because it was just like that concentrated. I didn't have a lot of other influences. So um, the reason I was homeschooled is because my parents are um, 
conservative, very religious West African immigrants. And um, anyone who's familiar in particular with West African Christianity, like there's a lot of like emphasis on the supernatural, right? <laughs> on there always being like other worlds aren't there, powers and principalities. So like angels, demons, like that's just, you know, there are so many aspects of Christianity that you can focus on and that's what they focused on. <laughs> so like from the time I was really little, I was like, yeah, sure. Like there's, you know, there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there. <laughs> and then that mixed with West African storytelling. Like I grew up, my mom is a, is a wonderful storyteller with the sound effects that are very, you know, indicative of the Yoruba and all the different characters like Anansi and his sons. Um, and then um, while my exposure to what was considered witchcraft was very regulated because of what my parents felt, um, they were also very academic in terms of making sure that I had access to lots of information. So mythologies were allowed, even if like, like I wasn't allowed to read Harry Potter, for example, but I was allowed to read these big tomes of like Egyptian mythology and Greek mythology because those were academic. <laughs> and of course, learning, you know, the folk tales of, of the Yoruba and the Edo, which were the two tribes my parents came from. Um, so... I did still read fantasy books. I snuck them in because um, those worlds always did appeal to me. And part of it is because of how much more often girls are the protagonists of a lot of fairy tales. There's still a lot of messed up gender role stuff that happens, of course, in fairy tales. But um, in particular, that window of representation was really important to me as a young girl, being a Black person, but especially a Black girl that loves speculative fiction means loving a genre that doesn't often love you back, you know? So if I wanted to feel represented as a Black girl, I had to read stories that were generally about slavery or growing up in the projects or things like that. Those were the only books available to me with a Black girl on the cover. And if I wanted an experience of like a girl being brave and going on an adventure, it would usually be like middle grade fantasy. I read a lot of Gail Carson Levine, Ella Enchanted, Two Princesses of Bamar. She was very, very formative for me. Um, so fantasy, as I started writing it as a child, became a place where I could be all of the things that I felt I could be um, without any of those constraints of only having to have windows of like, well, <laughs> you can be black or you can be a girl <laughs> or you can be, you know, like, I, I just felt like, you know, in fantasy, I could make the rules and I could be this weird daughter of Nigerian immigrants who grew up in California, but also wears princess dresses and can go on quests and do her own thing. So, yeah, it was a pretty natural progression for me, too. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it finds its way in, whether it's our mothers or our culture imagination and dreaming is within all of us, I think. Um, and so thinking about the genre, like on the surface, you know, it's limitless, like whatever you can imagine, you can do, you can be or create, but there are challenges in terms of diverse representation that are embedded within like the very traditions and foundations of creating within this genre. And I'm thinking about like who gets to be the hero in the story versus who the sidekicks or martyrs are, what groups are typically empowered in these narratives, even the popularity of building worlds with westernized colonial mentalities or filling worlds with dark savages or races that need to be either civilized or conquered. So what challenges <laughs> or limitations have you seen in the genre around diverse representation? One of the things that was interesting about, you know, my upbringing was that, you know, I grew up in, you know, one of the most racist states in the, you know, in our country, you know, <laughs> and, you know, so it's like racism and, 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 and again, who gets to do what is like, you know, really, really, um, in, it's embroiled in like the air in Mississippi, you know, so I didn't really think about like, what was being seen or the fact that it wasn't a black doctor who <laughs> even you know it still isn't actually well actually a black woman doctor who but that's never mind that's a that's a that's a worm, <laughs> that's a wormhole i'm not gonna go down that one um yeah and so you know i really wasn't thinking about those particular politics until much later you know until i got into you know graduate school or working on my work as a as a professor at the university of illinois i realized that 
there was a dearth of representation across the board. And that particular type of uh, erasure is extremely, I think sometimes it's very conscious and sometimes it's just like, it's just a matter of fact, like you just, you, you just, you, you, you work with who you, who you know, you make things about what you know, you know, and it's kind of like a sympathetic racism to a certain degree or exclusion. But then also there's this term called uh, uh, symbolic annihilation, you know, which comes out of so sociology uh, area in the 1970s that basically is like if you don't show people, then you actually, it's a type of like violence against them, you know, because basically you're showing that they don't exist. I mean, just think about like 1950s sitcoms, for instance, right? You know, except for the ones where like black folk are, you know, uh, maids or whatever, you don't really see folk of color at all, right? So you would assume that they don't live in the suburbs, that they don't, they're not successful, those types of narratives, right? And so there's a serious amount of limitation around like, you know, just, you know, intersectional representation, uh, all these different things that are happening. So yes, um, I, I do like a lot of work in comics and, you know, it's uh, the original comics images around people of color are very, very stereotypical, you know, because they're coming directly out of, out of like blackface minstrelsy and other like common representational, uh, egregious representations of people of color, you know, coming out of the 1930s. I mean, up until the 1930s, I mean, blackface minstrelsy was like rock and roll, <laughs> you know, it was extremely popular, right? And so, of course, the visual idioms that you see in that particular area are going to dominate how you caricaturize people, right? So that kind of thing it takes a long time until you see folk of color in those spaces. I mean, you have like all these different pioneers in, in speculative fiction, like people, of course, like Sammy R. Delaney, you know, who's a black gay man, a man working in that space in the 1950s. And you have, and it's a dearth of folk until much later, like you know, people like Octavia Butler, of course, right? Who we all love and, and revere, right? So. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fighting and, and, and people always question like, well, why do you want to do this? <laughs> you know? And, you know, again, like I really wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't as political, politically centered or thinking about my identity like I was now, you know, until like much later and realizing like, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> there needs to be more people uh, uh, that look like me to look like folk that I know. And so that's kind of like how I started that way. And I, th I think I started with design. I was a design professor. So I started there and started working out. And I think that's why I became a really interdisciplinary scholar looking at the types of worlds that were being um, discussed and stuff. And now it's, prim it's, prim it's pretty much whatever, it's all I teach now. You know, I actually only teach like comics and Afrofuturism classes now because of that, so. I think, I think erasure is a huge aspect, of course, but then there's also just the bad representation, right? <laughs> so one thing that's really common in my genre, which is young adult fiction, um, young adult fantasy in particular, you have a lot of good white heroines who are, you know, taking back the kingdom, like white feminism and stuff like that. And when there are people of color, um, they usually serve to progress the white heroine's moral journey. You know, like I cannot count the number of times I have read a scene or watched a scene in the adaptations of these stories where a good white heroine cries over the dead body of a black person and there she's like i will avenge them you know because they were so good and so magical and now you know that i'm a good person because i'm not the one who killed the black person i'm the one avenging them and from the time i was a young teenager i was just like I wonder why the good black people in this story don't get to survive in these magical stories. And what I came to realize is that if a black person, and especially if you've established that they're good or they're powerful, gets to survive to the end of the story, that would mean you have to give them something to live for other than progressing the plot that includes the heroine. They would have to have goals of their own. They would have to have their own happily ever after even as a side character. And that is beyond the imagination of a lot of white authors, even when they don't intend to. I just, I don't think it even occurs to them like, oh, well, after the adventure, what does the black best friend do? Does she want to start a bakery? Does she want to like go on? It's like, no, no, she has to die and be, you know, someone who's remembered fondly and with sadness. 
Um, I it sounds like a really specific trope, but it's so common. Like once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's either like the black captain of the guard who you know dies protecting the kingdom, <laughs> or you know like it's just over and over and over again. If they're there, um, because of course there's the erasure thing too, where it's like even though this is a fantasy kingdom, it still subscribes to an imaginary Europe that has never existed in which there were almost no people of color. You know, where I'm just like, look, like the hub of European culture, especially the kind of conglomerate of medieval and Renaissance that is usually being represented in European coded fantasy. It's like, it's highly influenced by like, you know, Italy, France, these centers of culture which were, you know, really close to Africa. People seem to forget, like, Italy and Africa are like this from, like, way before the medieval period, trade up from Ethiopia and from all of these places was bustling. If you listen to any, like, medieval, even music from the British Isles, you hear those Moorish influences. If you've heard, like, a hurdy-gurdy, like, all of those, like, minor notes and stuff, I'm just like, that's because there were black people <laughs> and brown people that literally made it to the British Isles to influence music that heavily. Like, it's it's this Europe, this lily white Europe has never, ever, ever existed. And, um, and it makes even less sense to represent it in fantasy, right? Because even if it did exist, it's like, okay, but you make up the rules of this world. What made you decide they're only white? Um, so, yeah, that's, Again, it's a genre that doesn't love you back as a black kid. Um, but when you see the potential, um, you write yourself in anyway. And then when you have the, if you have the opportunity to get an education in that area, you realize that you should have been there to begin with because even these European coded worlds that were based on, you were there. <laughs> so, you know, and that, that doesn't even begin to start the fact that, you know, it doesn't have to be Europe coded, that, pretty much everywhere in the world there were cities there were dynasties there were empires there were forces of good and evil all of these archetypes that we tend to return to in fantasy existed west africa had palaces it had empires so did south america so did obviously the asian continent like you know there's there's no real reason to default to this structure except that that's the literature we were raised with and so that's the setting of a lot of our imaginations until we, you know, get access to others. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. We have been here all along <laughs> and yes. we need more of us, yes, on the page and in empowered positions. Um, so in terms of needing empowering representation, I think of both of your bodies of work as restoring, which Ebony Elizabeth Thomas defines as reshaping traditional narratives to represent a diversity of perspectives and experiences that are often missing or silenced in mainstream media. And for you, Jordan, I think of restoring through reimagination, creating new worlds that not only reflect us all, but also work to interrogate some of those constructed systems of oppression that you mentioned. And for you, John, I think of restoring through adaptation by translating stories into richly visual formats, literally bringing color to the page and making space for visual imagination and literature. So can you both talk about your works and how your works create speculative worlds that both reflect our society and disrupt the Western traditions of the genre? Well, it's interesting because I think restoring applies in some cases. I think honestly that there's so much original content though with Black speculative creators that I don't know if I'm even using her term as she meant it correctly, that restoring, I don't know, really encaptures it. Because, you know, a lot of these worlds and these narratives, they aren't retellings of white, you know, it, it's not like, you know, Sleeping Beauty, but Black. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of thing, I also think is 110% valid because it's like, okay, if 
you took a bunch of people from their culture and then raise them with these stories, these stories are now part of their identity and they completely deserve to represent themselves, right? So I also think retellings of Western tropes with, you know, people of, with people of color is completely valid. On the other hand, Black people and people of color have created these stories and these tropes and these ways of storytelling since the beginning of time, right? A lot of it was influenced by those people in the first place. <laughs> you know, there's so many things. It's funny, um, one of my favorite lines from a funny movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, is the fact that the father like says like, give me a word, any word, the, the, the basis is Greek, <laughs> which obviously isn't true, but like, I, like, I find myself kind of leading towards that sometimes in terms of Blackness, because I'm just like, no, if you look far enough, a Black person came up with it. <laughs> like, well, and for America in particular, that's very true, right? Anything uniquely American in terms of music, in terms of storytelling style that didn't come from Europe and stuff, it probably came from the influx of Black people who brought their music, who brought their storytelling, who brought their fantasy, all that stuff. Um, and especially in terms of American fantasy, like anything like um, a lot of American mythological creatures and stuff with the storytelling and the hauntings and stuff like that are deeply influenced by Black Southern culture. I often describe my work as the sum of all my cultural influences because it does have some Western European fairy tale tropes because those were a big part of what I, what was in my education growing up but it also has loads of influence of West African storytelling, like griots, um, you know, the story musician historians um, of West Africa that still exist to this day, have existed for thousands of years, um, play a big role. And, you know, the way someone learns something is to tell or be told a story, you know, rather than say the more European fairy tale moralistic, like they went out and the bad thing happened or they were abused, but remained kind and good. And then they were rewarded. Like that tends to be a very European moralistic fairy tale structure. And so the ways in which my story does represent some Western things, like there are fairies in my story. They have Afros, but they are fit. There are fairies, <laughs> you know? Um, there are ghosts or shades, which are a very Western concept. Um, you know, the idea of like there being a form that's separate from someone's physical body is a very like Platonian concept. Right. Um, if you if you tried to describe a ghost to someone from West Africa, especially a few decades ago, they would imagine a zombie. They're like, oh, like if a if a dead person comes back to life, that includes their body. There's not this spiritual aspect. Um, and that's, so that's a Western concept that I, you know, I grew up with the concept of ghosts, so those make it into my story, right? But, um, yeah, but the, that moralistic European thing, that's something that my story deconstructs. It's like, you can be kind and good and gentle, but if you live in a society or a system that is meant to abuse your demographic, you're not necessarily going to be rewarded with anything, <laughs> you know, like, um, and, and in particular with African mythology, a lot of it doesn't serve to show how things should be, you know, like, it's just, it's like that just so story. It's like, hey, things are this way because the gods decided to make it this way, not because this is the right and good way of the world or the world has fallen and that's why these bad things happen. It's like, nope. You know, we grow things underground because one time Shango got mad and like sent his lightning bolts and <laughs> and like destroyed all the crops above ground. So another god came and taught us to let grow yams and stuff that Shango couldn't destroy with lightning. And that's why we grow yams, you know, just, just so. Um, so I think that all of those different aspects of my upbringing and where who raised me, but also where I was raised, which was here in California, um, all influenced my writing that way. When I think about this, yeah, the adaptation is a, is a probably like a relatively new aspect of my creative process. You know, my, my um, very fortunate actually to have been able to adapt you know, work on Nadia Korafor for my new line of books with Abrams. Uh, and also, you know, the two Octavia Butler, soon to be three uh, Octavia Butler books, but, you know, working on Parable of Talents as well. 
And, um, but yeah, but my background is in art and, and design. And so design is a type of problem solving. You know, and I always think of like storytelling as kind of a prosthetic or technology that we use to understand the world through. Uh, mythologies themselves are extensions of ourselves that we use to actually make sense of everything, right? And so to me, they function very much like a technology, like a, like a prosthetic or like some type of um, adaptive instrument that we, that we like apply, like an epistemology to look through the world at. And, you know, of course, you know, depending upon who's looking through that lens, you know, um, that story shifts, right? And that's, you know, which is one of the reasons why I chose the name Megascope for the line is because, you know, it borrows from the W.E.B. Du Bois short story, you know, The Princess Steel, where, you know, this, this device allows people to look through time and space, but it, but it basically changes according to who that person is, which I think is really interesting, which is very much like a story, right? It shifts according to, you know, who is reading it, the, the interpretation of, and, and who isn't reading it. So, you know, so a lot of my, my uh, ideas around like story making and things talk, you know, are really, do, are really about like creating um, very useful like prototypes to kind of look at the world through, you know, because I feel that speculative fiction is a way for us to kind of distance ourselves from particular social issues too. We can enjoy them, but we can also through metaphor and through um, allegory, you know, kind of digest things a little bit more easily, you know, or, or actually even like through catharsis come to some kind of like common ground. It depends, I guess it depends on the, on the genre and what the story is. Um, yeah, so I always think about like, I'm really interested in like different types of techno technological aspects, you know, even race itself functions kind of like a technology because it shifts according to like who's interacting with it. And it's, it's not a real thing. It's actually, a it's a fantastic thing, right? It's societally, it's real, but biologically, not so much, right? So, so it, it kind of functions like that too. So to me, whenever I'm writing about race, I'm writing about sci-fi, you know, cause it's not, it's not a real thing but it's believed to be right, to, to be like, kind of like, you know, any type of like witchcraft or sorcery, right? <laughs> Where you believe in it, it's real. Um, anyway, so, so yeah, so I think like my stories are doing that. So through like curatorial work, through my pedagogical activities, you know, I'm trying to unpack through storytelling what those things are. Um, for the adaptation piece, I was like extremely, you know, like humbled and, and, and fortunate to, to be able to do that type of work. But the, the crux of my work is as a creator and as a, an artist and a, you know, and as a curator, you know. Uh, one of my um, favorite films about like speculative fiction is called uh, The Last Angel of History. It's by uh, John Confra, uh, who's from, you know, a, and I forget which country he's originally from, Africa, my goodness, I'm stupid. Anyway, but it's, uh, he's, but he's, he was raised in the UK and he came up with this, this film that actually like looks at like the connections between Afrofuturism, or like black speculative culture and music. And he created this character called the Data Thief, which I'm like utterly fascinated by because I love time travel already, Doctor Who fan, right? Um, but the, so the Data Thief is a time traveling like archeologist who's trying to piece together the histories or the multiple histories of like black culture throughout time and space and, 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 and bring them back to the people, so to speak, in a very like, you know, like Eshu or like, you know, if you want to go Western with it, then, you know, Prometheus, right? <laughs> you know, um, yeah. And so I really kind of looked at like the process by which we're doing this, these, these collective works as kind of being like data thieves, like not necessarily physically time traveling, but, but, you know, kind of like th theoretically or like uh, metaphorically traveling through the, through the detritus of time. Cause a lot of times you're finding things that's been lost. Like for instance, like the, like the W.E.B. Du Bois story that was just sitting in his papers. They found it in 2015. He wrote that in like 1909. It was just sitting there. Yeah. I know that's why I was like, "What?" So, I'm like, how many things are like that that could be seen as 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 a uh, speculative fiction that we're really like need, need to re to reimagine? I mean, to me, like the the um, and I'm gonna end with this the 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 person I think that actually starts us thinking about this a lot is Sherry Renee Thomas, right? Because she, with um, her collection Dark Matter, um, she basically looks at over a hundred or so years of like black speculative culture, you know, but she she puts on the lens of black, when you say speculative culture, she starts to say that, well, wait a minute, Zora Neale Hurston's work is speculative, W.B. Du Bois' stuff is speculative, George Shiloh's stuff is speculative. So she gives us a canon by which we can actually interact with, which I think is extremely exciting. And I hope that in some small fashion, the work that I do is carrying that torch, so to speak. Thank you both, yes. For me, I think about it's reclaiming reclamation. Yeah. 
your own way, we are reclaiming our spaces and our stories and bringing them to our readers today. Um, so I'd like to dive deeper into understanding your creative process a little bit for writing and illustrating diverse worlds. Um, for Jordan, what was your writing process like for building out the Ray Barrow world, which is full of reimagined real world cultural influences? And for John, um, what's your adaptation and creative process like? How do you decide what elements to highlight when you're when you're thinking about the text, but then when you're thinking visually. So anything about the process you'd like to share, be great. I mean, real quick, I just wanna say, John, the parable of the sewer graphic novel is so good. It just like melted my brain. It's so, especially since like we both live out here, like right. that particular oh, yes. story, since it's set in like a post-apocalyptic Los Angeles and they're traveling nice. on 101. Like in my mind, it was already vivid and you just, brought it to life it was amazing well i mean you think, thank my, my my co adapter damien duffy for a lot of that too because he has the heavy lifting of like actually taking like he's he's translating the script but yeah i actually did use pieces of the color schemes of the area and the yeah, yeah 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 i can tell stuff. yeah but thank you for so that <laughs> <laughs> um Sorry for using the time just to fangirl a little bit but um yeah um my research process was a lot <laughs> so I don't regret the direction I chose to take with the Ray Barry series. Um, one thing a lot of people don't know, or maybe they do now, I started it when I was 13. The Ray Barry series was originally a way for me to process my experience as a girl being who was homeschooled until she was 13, then getting to attend a school. It was a very small school. My graduating cl class was 17 people. And so we were, it was my, not only my first time being with people around my own age, six hours a day, five days a week, it was this unusually intimate group of teenagers. We went to all of our classes around together on the campus. We, on our time off, we all hung out together, like at each other's houses, boys and girls, just together, these teenagers. And so the premise of the Ray Barry series, you know, it's these teenagers who are you know, kind of groomed to rule with this emperor when they're an adults and they're like mentally bonded and get physically ill if they spend any time apart. And so it's both sinister and really loving, but I wanted to make this world, this setting of it really rich with all of these aspects. But as a 13 year old, I had never read a black fantasy in my life. They didn't exist, at least not for my age group, not for my genre. Um, there were mythologies, of course, um, lots of aspects of Black fantasy that way, but um, I didn't feel I had permission to explicitly write a story with like a West African setting and stuff, right? So instead I went really vague, <laughs> like it was a hot mess. Like everybody had these kind of like Latin Afro Greek names and their clothing was kind of like these shapeless robes and the setting looked a little bit like California, but you know, back way back when, and also a little bit like Oregon, which is where I went to school. And it wasn't until I got to college. I was, I was pretty young in college, so I was still, you know, figuring a lot of stuff out. Um, I was 16. Um, when I got to college, I just kind of went the other extreme. I was like, no, if you don't make cultures, I mean, this isn't an extreme, this is a true statement that if you don't make cultures specific, people will automatically fill them in as European. <laughs> but I did go to the other extreme in that I was like, I'm going to get so specific and I'm going to include all of them. <laughs> I'm going to include the Shona of Southeast Africa. I'm going to include the Yoruba of West Africa. I'm going to include Han Chinese. I'm going to include Joseon period Korea. I'm going to include this dynasty of South Asia, everything. And um, that's kind of like why my background is this way. This is one of my first aesthetic boards. Like, you know, tigers are obviously not African, but that, you know, this there's this whole part of Asia that I included. Um, you know, you have Guinean culture, you have um, some Kenyan culture represented, the Kikuyu, obviously the Yoruba. And so I had to do so much research. <laughs> like, I think that's something that a lot of writers of color don't get credit for is that there isn't this automatic shorthand that's available to authors writing Eurocentric patterns. Because if you say castle, people know what that looks like. Um, but if you, you know, there are different kinds of castles if you don't mean a European one. So you have to be way more specific if you're like, no, I mean like 
a Japanese style palace castle and what does that look like or I mean like a Mansa Musa kind of like structure you know that you know you have to research that and describe it more specifically and because you're describing more specifically that makes you more vulnerable to like represent a culture inaccurately or in a wrong way even though it's technically one you're making up you're definitely basing it on these real world cultures and so you know, I've seen black people just get like, or, or people, writers of color and fantasy in general get ripped apart for inaccurately representing like one aspect of a culture. And I'm just like, this is fantasy. Like it would be one thing if it was disrespectful or like reinforcing a like harmful stereotype. But if it's just like, you know, I do feel like everyone should have the freedom <laughs> to make these speculative worlds and make them fantastical, right? Um, you know, nobody goes to Lord of the Rings expecting it to be an accurate representation of medieval Welsh culture, despite that being one of the big influences. And so um, I don't think it's fair to go to, say, a East Asian fantasy and say, actually, this doesn't represent, you know, <laughs> the real structure of this period of the Han Chinese, you know, um, but we do get a lot of that. So the answer to what was your process for world building was so much research. And I am looking, while I love the Ray Barra series, don't regret anything, I am looking forward to writing something that is smaller in scope. <laughs> Maybe I'll pick two real world cultures to research instead of 14. <laughs> that might be fun. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> You're funny. Uh, so that's a lot of that's a lot of cultures. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Um, let's see, where do I start? Adaptation thing, right? Adaptation. All right. So fortunately, I've had I have a team, I have a team member named Damian Duffy, who I've been working with for almost 20 years. He's a really close friend of mine, and we've been making comics and all kinds of stuff in, in that in that era. And so we were able to work on, you know, Kindred and Parabola Sword together and Parabola Talents. He's already done with the the script is like on me to draw it now. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, the adaptation process, you have to realize like because different media have different affordances, you know, they, they can tell stories differently. Um, as soon as you start translating one story into like a comic or into other any media, you already are changing the narrative to a certain degree because you're changing how it's going to be told, you know, so comics a particular medium that deal with storytelling very differently than prose or from television or radio or whatever right so that's the first thing the other thing is that in comics you show and you don't tell right so for instance the descriptions that you're talking about jordan we don't necessarily have to do that because we just show we just show it right <laughs> so but you do have to do the research on like how it's you know structured or what have you but you say okay well this is what it looks like you know and then that's that's one of the simpler things as far as like showing and not telling um the other thing to remember about like adaptation in the comics form is that every aspect of the page is a storytelling opportunity. So that means the page layout, that means color. I mean, color is like soundtrack to the comic book, actually. <laughs> you know, that's why I love coloring so much, because it's almost like it sets the sound, it's almost like the mood setting, right? Um, the panel design, the, the, the typefaces that you use, the, the placement of things, you know, all these different things, the gutter space, even which we do a lot in After the Rain, you know, we actually fill up the gutter because we want, wanted people to feel really claustrophobic, right? So um, that's the other thing to remember. It's like, so when you're translating this stuff, like what is, what is it, what is the comic bookishness thing that comics do better than anything else? Uh, for instance, in Kindred, one of the things we did was, you know, when Dana, who was the main character in Kindred, is time traveling, uh, she always carries the satchel, right? And so what we could do with it, you know, and pretty seamlessly is to show the contents of the satchel with a diagram, because comics you do diagrams really easily and really, it's like part of what they're good for. You know, if you look at like your, um, the, 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 the brochures that you get when you're traveling on an airplane, they're, those are comics, you know, they're just like, do this, do this, do this, right? And so they, we're, we're used to that vernacular and how they function. So using that kind of stuff to actually augment storytelling. Like when we get to the Wayland Plantation Kindred, we actually use a map to actually show what, you know, where everything, where, where everything is. And we're probably gonna be doing something even more extravagant in Parallel of Talents because Acorns layout is wild, right? <laughs> so, because um, it because the space actually matters when you when you're doing comics because time is kind of equal to space in comics, you know? Because you know basically like the panels are like slivers of time. So th these are these are concerns that have to 
come into play when you're adapting something from prose into comics in particular. Um, you know, uh, uh, with, with Nettie's book, you know, which I, I'm in love with that short story. It's like the only horror story that I think that she's probably read, uh, written. And it's so much about who she is, you know, dealing with being, you know, born, you know, born in the States, but actually traveling back and forth to Nigeria quite a bit. And then actually kind of being in this liminal space is kind of like what we kind of played up. Uh, there were certain things that were in the story that we wanted to uh, augment. And as you as you see, like once she gets to the point where she's kind of resolved the problem, the trauma, this, the panels get more structured, you see. So, so that kind of thing where it's like the, the medium itself, because it's so symbolically and so real inherently, it actually lends itself to this type of storytelling really easily, you know. I mean, it's really, I mean, I think comics are just really surreal. When everything can be a, when everything can be a picture and everything means something, that's like a dream, right? I mean, it's like a, it's like a dream. So, um, so that's that. As far as like my own stuff, like I said, I'm I think very pragmatically about like story building. I'm really like I really like the fact like like Tolkien, for instance. You know, Tolkien was a linguist, right? And so he kind of built his world around languages, right? Like these different languages, and that's kind of like what the 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 thing was that actually what what you would call a fictive neology. That's what uh that's what Isfahan Suzanne Rune calls it in his book, The Seven Beauties of Science Fiction fictive neology that is a category of like new words because if you have a new world then you have new you have new names for things right and so i think it's important to actually have like you know some things sound familiar and you use them in context and people start to understand what that world is um and science fiction in, in particular you know there's this idea of the new idea of the fictive novum which is really fascinating to me like if you look at something like blade runner for instance which has a really rich world you know the idea of like offshore I mean, off-planet mining and stuff is, is, is the kind of fictive, uh, fictive novel, like being able to travel to those spaces. But then what happens is you need artificial people to work on those spaces, right? And then what happens? So, so from, from creating those you know, fictive ideas, you start to understand like all these different things that compartmentalize systems. And so when you sit down and you think like, what's the plausible space that I can work in? You, you have like a richness that starts to happen, right? Because then you also, if you look at the future, you're talking about a fictional history, right? <laughs> so then you have to create like, well, what, if I'm thinking about the future, then what could I extrapolate, which Octavia Butler was wonderful at, obviously, to the point where it's terrifying. <laughs> so it's like, you know, um, is uh, you have to imagine what that future history could be, right? So these, these are really interesting things to me. And then of course, I'm really, really into what they call diegetic prototypes. You know, that is creating objects that actually are just created to be stories. You know, that kind of thing. They actually have discourse, you know. Um, and we borrow some, like for instance, um, George Shiler's Black No More Chair, you know, from the 1931 uh, book that he wrote called Black No More, where it was a chair that could actually turn you, turn Black people into white people, but not phenotypically, right? This is a 1931 science fiction story from the Harlem Renaissance. So that chair actually has, it was created for, to have a discussion. It was, it's a satire, obviously. It's, it's, it's actually like looking at race and the silliness of race. And then, um, and actually like actually critiquing the, uh, the Harlem Renaissance too, because he was actually not, you know, not really big into the Harlem Renaissance. So, you know, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting way to use objects in, in speculative fiction, I think. So those are things that really, I'm kind of like really obsessed with creating objects that actually talk to you in a certain way, right? Um, yeah, and I love comics. I love comics because they speak very directly because they're tricky to make and it's, uh, and they're kind of like an underdog medium still. You know, people are still like, oh man, comics are, are still being created. <laughs> well, like comics can do literature. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> wow, you can literature with comics? Anyway, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Oh, such different processes and so interesting. I love it. I love it. Um, I, say I also like using literature as a verb. Like I'm going to do that from here on out. Yeah. <laughs> can you literature with... <laughs> this is great. You can literature with fantasy. <laughs> so I have one final question for you and thinking about how we can offer students opportunity to reimagine and reclaim their own stories. Um, what writing strategies or tips do you have for teachers to use with their students to help them authentically reimagine their own worlds? I mean, for writing strategies, pretty much my, you know, I, I think 
representation is huge. I became a writer because I was a reader. You know, I think giving them access to different kinds of stories, like like even one really basic thing that was actually a good aspect of homeschooling for me was, um, you know, there were some negative ones, but the good aspects were, um, you know, getting to go to the library, just getting as many stacks of books as I wanted pretty much at any hour of the day. <laughs> and I remember there was this trend, I guess, in the late 90s, early 2000s, where they had picture books that were retellings of it was usually Cinderella, although they had other mm -hmm. like fairy tales as well. It was like the Egyptian Cinderella, the Persian Cinderella, the West African yeah. Cinderella. And they were just these big, gorgeous picture books. Um, I wish I thought to like take some down to show you. I, I bought some that I used to read when I was little. I looked everywhere for them that were just retellings of these fairy tales, but completely in like a different cultural skin. Like this, like one of my favorites is the story of um of who spins gold, Rumpelstiltskin, but told through the perspective of um, a Caribbean princess <laughs> and Rumpelstiltskin is like, they call him Knit Man, <laughs> like, like this little like man who's just like, yeah. And it's, they're just beautifully drawn. Um, that, was, that was major for me. Like even just getting to see myself, I was like, oh, so of course I'm going to write someone who looks like me as well. I think one of the reasons why uh... I am so adamant about like putting together these um, conventions like the one in Harlem and things of that nature is to actually like not only empower the readers, of course we definitely want to do, but also the creatives as, as well. So I was trying to figure out a way to actually get um, or help to facilitate getting um, creators of color, uh, Black creators into these institutional spaces where kids can have access to them, you know, like, you know, so that's, so I think now having co-founded like three of those events probably but probably want to do another one it's just stupid anyway it's just so much work but you know one of the things that's really interesting about it is that you you create a, a readership who who really don't have the same issues that i had you know like and, and that is like seeing or actually uh jordan too like seeing seeing uh ourselves reflected back at us you know what i'm saying i want to get to the point where that just becomes not an issue at all you know where, where these things are normalized i think that's coming but um as far as like writing, uh, specifically about comics, you know, co writing comics is difficult, but it's it's uh, a writing thing that I'm trying with my students right now is uh, is taking wordless comics because they do have wordless comics actually, and then um, kind of uh, deconstructing them by writing what they see on the panel is a really cool exercise. You know, so if you see Spider Man just swinging through the building, you know, or by a building, you just have to write that. So because even though it's wordless, it's still being written, you know, because <laughs> artist it has to be described to it to an, to an artist to draw it. Um, and even even if something is silent, it's actually being described by someone. So, and a lot of times when you're writing a comic, you're not writing for an audience at all, except for that one person who is the artist, right? You're writing a comic book script for the artist, and so that kind of writing is is is, is very it's different, you know. But I think honestly, it it kind of enhances. Uh, visual acuity and also kind of like your, your your reasoning as far as like what you're seeing on the page so. so along with the writing strategy shared by jordan and john i also wanted to include a few texts and resources that teachers can use to help create writing environments that honor students unique stories and self-expression and give students tools to write in a representative way um, the first two texts here, the Anti-Racist Writing Workshop and Craft in the Real World, both provide really practical examples of how to decenter whiteness in writing and how to set up classroom writing environments that are a bit more reciprocal and nurturing um, when we're thinking about the writing workshop model, which is not how it's typically set up. <laughs> so both of those texts also provide writing exercises and prompts that you can use with your students. Writing the other and writing with color are both resources that dive a bit deeper into how we can write more authentically when we have characters of color present in our narratives. And the content within this book and this website range from providing explanations on various stereotypes and tropes to writing exercises that focus on developing dimensional characters of color. So in terms of critically engaging with speculative fiction and media, 
I do think the genre is changing and more and more we can find creators like Jordan and John and these really empowering and imaginative landscapes filled with people of color. But we still do have so much of this genre filled with distorted and damaging representations, especially when it comes to characters of color. So it's important to think about ways to approach this genre with your students using an anti-racist or anti-bias lens. So utilizing critical questions that help evaluate elements of diversity and deconstruct these works, similar to the ways that which we deconstruct other literature in the classroom, it's really important. So considering utilizing questions that focus on world building, that analyze the representation in the setting, um, asking questions like, does the fictional setting reflect the diversity of our world? How does the fictional world's population represent and treat BIPOC communities? Looking for commonly used racial stereotypes and tropes, um, thinking about things like the exotic other or the doomed BIPOC sidekick or the dark-skinned aggressor or placeholder characters um, that are diverse but are just there to check off the diversity box. Thinking about cultural misappropriation, watching out for cultural elements that are used without cultural context in a way that is very shallow. Um, looking for damaging and negative descriptions of BIPOC characters, thinking about how are these characters of color and native characters described by the narrator? How are they described by other characters? Um, also watching out for unaddressed bias. Is there normalized bias language or thought? Like what type of language do characters use to describe differences? Are cultural beliefs or practices mocked, misunderstood, or are they respected? And then finally, power. This is a big one that I always keep an eye towards, examining the power structures and relationships between the groups. What agency do BIPOC characters have in relationship to other groups that are present? And what actions do BIPOC characters take in navigating spaces with other groups from dominant races, ethnicities, or cultures? Thinking about who is in power and who is empowered to do things. So we also have some resources for finding diverse and speculative fiction. I want to highlight the new um, imprint Megascope that John is heading. Uh, Megascope is a line of graphic novels that's dedicated to showcasing speculative and nonfiction works by and about people of color. And they focus on science fiction, fantasy, horror, history, and magical realism. So definitely check them out. Um, I just finished After the Rain and it is amazing. So I think your students would like it too. And then other review sources that you can check out to find books um, about characters of color in various genres. Rich in Color is a great site for finding new releases. We all know we need diverse books, but we have to keep promoting them because they're amazing and doing good work to highlight who's publishing um, diverse texts. And then Geeks of Color and Nerds of Color focus more within the speculative fiction and media realm. They're looking at films and games and movies and TV series and writing critical reviews about them. So when our students are engaging in other forms of media that aren't literature based, these platforms are great to go to get a critical analysis too. And then researchers, if you're really interested in diving into some of the theory and background within speculative media, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas does great work and has The Dark Fantastic, um, which focuses on exploring race and popular youth and young adult speculative fiction. SR Tolliver, Stephanie Tolliver, um, does a lot with Black imagination. And on her website, she has a listing of authors who are creating Black stories. And then myself, um, on my website, one portion of it, there's a bit more um, framing for talking with students about some of the common tropes and stereotypes they might find in speculative media to go along with some of the critical questioning that you can do. Well, thank you both so much for sharing about your craft and your love of this genre. I'm so excited to see what you put out next. I thank you so much for your time. And if you have questions, you can find me through email and on social media. Jordan is on Instagram and John Jennings is on Twitter. 
and Instagram as well. And thank you so much to Abrams for giving us this opportunity to chat with amazing creators today.